Welcome to the Faith Matters Podcast. In this episode, Melissa Inouye and Jana Reese discuss what research and experience have taught them about why young Latter-day Saints become disaffected from the church, either temporarily or permanently, and how we might best respond to and support them during this process. Jana Reese is an independent researcher and author. Her latest book, The Next Mormons, explores this big question. Melissa Inouye is a professor of Asian studies at Auckland University in New Zealand. For more podcasts, articles, and community, go to faithmatters.org. Thank you so much for taking time out of your vacation to New Zealand (laughs) to talk to me. Um, This is very fortuitous, and I'm really glad we can have this conversation. So just basically, I want to ask you, um, you've just written a book, um, and um, one of the chapters, well, actually, many of the themes of your book include this kind of perennial question is, why do Latter-day Saints um, experience doubts? Why do they begin to lose trust in the institution of the church? Why do some of them leave the church? Um, what's, what's, what are all of these different processes? Um, what are the reasons why people feel like there's not a place for them here? Mm-hmm. And um, just in my experience, I think everyone's experienced you know, we have this idea of how you know, everyone has to find their own testimony. Everyone has doubts um, at one time or another. So this is familiar to me personally. Um, and then just in my circle of family and friends, I have a lot of people, um, the best people I know, actually, um, who feel like there's no place for them at church anymore. And um, so I just want to ask you, like, what did you find out in your research? Okay, well, first of all, Thank you for sharing a little bit of that personally, because I think that a lot of people who are in the church have um, the same situation, friends, family members, people that they grew up with who are leaving or who are still in, but perhaps are not happy. And so it's important to know why. Uh, The the research that I'm going to talk about is called the Next Mormons Survey, Mm -hmm. NMS, and we... Uh, Benjamin Knoll, who's a political scientist, and I conducted the survey in 2016, and we had 1,156 currently identified Mormons. These are people who on a a survey will say, I'm a Latter-day Saint, and then 540 former Mormons. So just before I start talking, the former Mormon population, because it's 540 people total, has a higher margin of error Mm -hmm. than we do for the current Mormons. And also, I'll be talking about what happens when we just look at millennials? What happens when we just look at women? And so the margin of error goes up a little bit more. As I remember, it was in this, it was like, what was the, what is that higher margin of error? Well, so for the whole sample of mm-hmm. former Mormons, the margin of error is 4.2%. Okay. And then when we're looking at these smaller groups of just a couple hundred people or even a hundred people, maybe, if we're looking at just millennial women or something like that, then we're looking up into the high single digits or even into the low double digits for margin of error. So just keep that in mind to be cautious. I think it's great with data to look at bigger trends and kind of larger trajectories. And also there's been enough research done on millennials and religion in America more generally, not just Mormons, but also evangelicals and Jews, Protestant, you know, uh, mainline Protestants, that we can look at Mormons in context which is a really important part of the story. Because in in Mormonism, we tend to think, what is the church doing or not doing that is driving disaffection? That's part of the story. But the bigger landscape of the story is huge. It's so important to remember that millennials as a whole, as a generation, have the highest rate of disaffiliation that we have seen in recorded social science history in the United States. This is not just unique to Mormons. And just to clarify there, it's, you are talking about the United States, the church in the United States. Right. We're Even though we Zealand. are in New Zealand right now. <laughs> yes. Um, we're in New Zealand, which is great. And they're having a polar vortex in the United States right now, which is very sad. But here we are and we're warm and it's pretty awesome. But I don't have any data about New Zealand. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. So um, what are the main reasons why... Yeah, and I assume actually this varies with generation. So maybe mm-hmm. you could just kind of lay out right. the landscape. Let me look at the whole picture 
first. And then we can look at a little bit of varying by gender and by generation. So the top five reasons for leaving for all former Mormons, this is the whole sample of 540 people. The first is I could no longer reconcile my personal values and priorities with those of the church, which is a very general kind of response. The second was I stopped believing there was one true church. Mm -hmm. So a, a basic loss of testimony in one or more areas, but specifically this idea that there was one true church. Third, I did not trust the church leadership to tell the truth surrounding controversial or historical issues. Mm -hmm. About a third of the population chose this as one of their top issues. Fourth was I felt judged or misunderstood. We should come back to that one in a minute. And then fifth was I drifted away from Mormonism. And that language is very interesting because in the, in the Latter-day Saint slash Mormon tradition, we have this idea that people go inactive, which is language I find fascinating. It's very active kind of language mm. to describe a process that for most people sociologically is much more about stepping away or just kind of quietly disappearing mm -hmm. than it is about make, waking up one right. day and you know, having this, this galvanizing action. Mm -hmm. So I drifted away from Mormonism was number five. Some of the other things, just briefly in the top 10, number six was I engaged in behaviors that the church views as sinful. Mm -hmm. Let's spend just a quick minute on that because this is probably the number one reason that Orthodox Mormons right. seem to think that they people just wanted the to church. drink. Right, they just so. wanted to drink, mm -hmm. they just wanted to have sex. Um, and I think on both extremes of that discussion, I see problematic logic. So the first is that it's really easy for members of the church to pin that on people who've left the church because it, it doesn't require any kind of personal responsibility on their part. Um, but when I hear uh, former Mormons talk about that logic and say that's ridiculous, it's not actually ridiculous, statistically. I mean, we do see a higher percentage, for example, correlation, not necessarily causation, but correlation between people who say they had premarital sex, which is twice as high in the former Mormon population as it is in the current Mormon population. Um, so we can't dismiss that as being a non-entity, but we mm. also can't say that that is the number one reason. It's not. That is not the number one reason, okay? Number seven, the church's position on LGBT issues. Mm. That's one we should revisit when we talk about millennials. Eight, the church's emphasis on conformity and obedience, which is interesting. So that's not necessarily a popular choice, particularly with some younger respondents. Number nine, oh, sorry, tied for eighth is lack of historical evidence for the Book of Mormon and or Book of Abraham. And 10 was the role of women in the church. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. I think we should apologize for the amateur level of this recording. I have very okay. low technical skills. We're sorry. We're sorry. Mm -hmm. When Tiana was in New Zealand, we said we have to have a conversation. So we're just mm -hmm. doing what we can. We're okay. sorry. <laughs> so, um... So that's kind of the broad overview of mm -hmm. everyone. And I'm sure that breaks down a little bit on a generation by generation level. Mm -hmm. So since we're um, a little pressed for time, what if we just start by talking about millennials specifically? Okay. So for millennials, we do see some interesting differences. Remember that the I felt judged or misunderstood was number four for the mm -hmm. population as a whole. For millennials, it's actually tied for first. So this idea of judgment, um, feeling like there isn't necessarily a place for you in the church seems to be more common. It's, it's pretty low down on the list among boomer silence, baby boomers and silent generation members. We combine those generations. Um, and so judgment doesn't seem to be quite the same level of immediacy for them that mm -hmm. it may be for younger, younger members of the church. Now, I assume yeah. that I felt judged. And that's quite broad. Mm -hmm. You can be judged for any number of things. You can be judged mm -hmm. for your hair, for your dress, for things you say, for your political positions. But the point is, it's just, did, did people say, you know, specifically why they felt judged? Mm -hmm. Or they just said, just people judged me. And this is the limitation of any survey. Right. So 
you know, in the book, for example, I, I have supplementary oral history interviews with mm. about five dozen millennials and Gen Xers. Oh, wow, that's a lot so of people. So we could get, yeah, <laughs> but it was great. I loved it. Um, so that we could get some, some great background mm. and context to understand what specifically did you feel judged about, for example. And, and those responses are very interesting. What I would love to see erased from the vocabulary mm. of members of the church, especially the ones who are older, but also younger ones who don't necessarily understand why their cohort members are leaving, is this, this notion that it's their fault that they feel judged mm -hmm. or that they got offended. Right. Right. Again, putting the blame or the responsibility on the person who's leaving rather than analyzing our own attitudes and actions and what may have been a catalyst for that sense of judgment. Right. That makes sense. Mm. Um, how do those things break down by gender out of curiosity that judgment question okay mm. number one for women as a whole right so I felt judged or misunderstood is the top reason cited by all women mm. all generations when when they are discussing why they left and another thing that's different very different about women who left versus men who left is that for women, um, the question of role of women in the church yes. ranked third. Mm. Yeah. So, you know, we have... Compared to men, which was... Yeah, I think for men it was 23rd. Let's go check. 23rd. Yeah, it's way down there. 24th. 24th. Role of women in the church. Only 8% of men who had left the church <laughs> said thinks, that that men. was one of their top <laughs> reasons for leaving. Right. And that's a really interesting finding because when you survey currently identified Mormons, it's women who are more orthodox about questions like priesthood, women and priesthood about questions like um, whether women have enough say, they have enough visibility in the church. So I think what we can conclude from this is that women who are still in the church are generally okay. They've made their peace with that in some way. Mm. But for women who left the church, this was a very present reason. This mm -hmm. is not an ancillary reason. So if we're going to... See, this is Patches, everyone, by I the way. This. She's a good girl. Um, I used to dog sit for Patches when she lived in the United States. So Hi. we bonded very because she pooped dog. in my shoe. <laughs> she did? <laughs> All right, what were we talking about? Women. <laughs> yes, women. so, so wait, the wait, women wait. who are still in the church, by and large, are, are satisfied, apparently, from the data. Not everyone, and certainly not younger women who are still in the church, who have stronger uh, sense of being troubled about women in the priesthood. Um, but a majority of women are okay with it. Uh, however, for women who left, this was an important factor. So you can't make blanket statements saying that all women are fine with women's roles in Mormonism. Right, and because it just seems true. to mean that people who are not fine just leave. Exactly. Right. So then, mm -hmm. um, and that would also suggest that you know, there, there are studies of Mormon women that show that um, they're, you know, by and large, most aren't, most don't um, feel dissatisfied with gender roles mm -hmm. in the situation, but that might also just reflect the fact that those who are there. Right, there's are the a winnowing in, in the survey sample. Right. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, so I was going to say about millennials, going back to them, I mentioned that the, the tide for first was this question of feeling judged or misunderstood. The other thing tied for first was I did not trust the church leadership to tell the truth surrounding controversial or historical issues. So there's this basic trust gap. And I would say that in the data, we didn't find any one particular historical issue right. to rise to the top. You know, the only one that even made the top 10 is this issue of the historicity of the Book of Mormon and the Book of Abraham. Mm. All of the other historical issues that we asked about, including seer stones, polygamy, polyandry, were down the list. So it's not necessarily individual things, but rather an aggregation of questions and people not necessarily feeling that they're always getting straight answers. Mm -hmm. Is that linked to the um, the other point that you said was a factor about people losing faith in the one true church mm. narrative? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Again, th this issue of correlation, right. I can tell you where we see patterns, but we can't say this caused this, mm. that caused that. Right. Yeah, that's much, much more difficult. Mm.
Mm -hmm. um, other things for millennials, I did want to point out that number three for millennials was the church's position on LGBT issues. This did not rank even in the top 10 among older people who had left the LDS church. Right. So LGBT issues has kind of zoomed up as being something very, very important. Overall, in the former Mormon population, compared to the current Mormon population, they are more politically liberal. They are like t almost 20 points different in their political identification along party lines. Mm. So that's a very interesting issue. And that's something that we also see much more broadly in America among people who are leaving religion versus people who are staying. Interesting. Mm -hmm. I'm just thinking about the current political climate in America and how that also may continue to kind of play into this feeling of um, discomfort that people have. Well, certainly it's impossible to avoid. Well, unless you come to New Zealand, in which case it's great. <laughs> you know, yeah, right? Actually, it's we... great. But um, if, you, if you are trying to go on a Sunday to, to your ward and someone gets up in fast and testimony meeting and bears testimony of political ideology that you don't agree with, that can be an extremely alienating experience, even in the best of times. And I think in the United States right now, it is, it is far from the best of times. We've never had a more polarized society that I can recall politically. Mm. And it's very interesting if you look at Gallup research stretching back into the 50s, where you can see bipartisan coalition around different issues and also around different precedents. Right. And so I, I can say with you know, some certainty, we, we have not had a more polarized time because the people who are supporting the president are almost entirely of that president's party. And that did not used to be the case. Mm, interesting. Mm -hmm. So um, in, embedded in this enormous survey, we had questions for former Mormons, not only about why they left, but also about what might have helped them to stay. And you do see Super. a strong relationship between those things. But it's interesting to think about with current members of the church, if they can be more introspective and analyze what perhaps they might be able to do right. to help people to stay. Um, among all former Mormons, the top issue was if the church had had more inclusive positions on social issues, such as same-sex marriage or women's roles in the church. The second was if ward members had been more loving and less judgmental. Oh, that's so sad. Yeah, it is. It's like a stake to the heart. I don't know if you, you've sat through that lesson, the gospel doctrine lesson. Uh, you know, we don't have this curriculum anymore, but the one about the, the pint of cream in Kirtland, the apostasy lesson about Kirtland, why people left. And it's, it's I'm sorry, I'm going to just say this. It's a terrible lesson. I mean, <laughs> historically, some of those stories don't necessarily add up. Right. There, there's so much more context mm -hmm. about why those people left. It wasn't because they didn't get a seat at the Kirtland Temple dedication. Mm -hmm. There are always other issues. And that's an important thing to remember right. for current people as well, for contemporary people that it's usually a constellation of things. Mm. Um, it's also demographic factors. It's your education level that might correlate with leaving, surprisingly, I think, for many people. It's uh, education. The more you have in Mormonism, it's actually better for church retention and activity. Uh, we have this idea that education might be a catalyst for losing faith. It actually seems to be more of a protective barrier for keeping faith. Mm. So that's kind of interesting. There are exceptions, but... Um, also, it would be growing up with divorced parents has a, a really interesting correlation with eventually leaving the church. And so this is not just Mormonism. And so social scientists in general have looked at this phenomenon. And one of the things that may be occurring is that if you are growing up with parents in different households, um, religiosity can be diluted. If, for example, one parent might be taking right. the children to church on yes. their weekend and the other parent isn't or... Uh, the, the parents might remarry someone of a different faith. So it's, it's a little bit harder to have that endogamous religious situation. Yeah, lots of interesting correlations. Men are a little more likely to leave than women, which is typical of American religion more generally. Mm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So, um, you know, I personally can't do anything about um, whether people I know have parents who are divorced. Right. But in terms of um, being more loving, less judgmental, I mean, everyone at church is striving to be loving, right? Um, specifically, mm -hmm. how could people be more loving? Really be careful to watch what you say. I think Mormons have a tendency to assume that everyone in the room 
feels the same way mm. about everything. And so that they're, they're simply preaching to the choir. Stop assuming <laughs> that you are preaching to the choir. For example, um, you know, I've talked to young, young adults who grew up in wards where they were closeted gay young members of the church. And to hear rhetoric that was directed at those homosexuals out there in the world mm. and how terrifying that was. I mean, imagine growing up in that situation where you recognize some, some truth about yourself that you are hearing disparaged mm -hmm. in the most sacred context of your life by people that you trust. By people you trust. Yes. Yeah, that can be really, life. really devastating mm. and have lifelong consequences. So Mormons, you know, be careful about mm. the words and the facial expressions that you, you exhibit at church. Make a point of recognizing that probably somewhere in your group, your Relief Society lesson, your youth lesson, that there's someone there who is quietly hurting and you need to be speaking to that person as well. Right. And I think that's a really effective um, way of kind of pinning that idea down. I mean, it's hard for me to always monitor my words, my facial expressions, but if mm -hmm. I just know um, who my audience is and I know that there's certain perspectives in my audience, it totally changes you know, the way that I address mm -hmm. an issue. Mm -hmm. you know, one of the, the other things that I would point out is that one of the surprising things that we learned in the data is the power of local church leaders, mm. especially bishops, and that millennials had very positive relationships with their bishops. Um, they had the highest rate of consulting with the bishop, not for an ecclesiastical endorsement for a, a wedding or a, you know, a mission, but actually just counseling with the bishop. Mm more than any other generation. And obviously there's an age effect there as well, that they're kind of young, they're looking for guidance from a parental figure that you don't necessarily need when you're in your 50s, 60s, whatever, and the bishop is maybe 35. Right. So that changes. But still, in, even in the oral history interviews, there was a, a, a real love and respect for bishops and very interesting stories about the ways that bishops had reached out to young people. So recognize that, that uh, for millennials in particular, there seems to be a, a, a need to connect on the grassroots level and that that is perhaps more present to them than the church writ mm. large, the, you know, the suits, the general conference, the slickness, the advertising. They don't respond to that as much. This is the farm to table generation. You know, mm. they, they don't respond to the corporate image as much as they do to the local conversations, the small ward community they like free range locally farmed Mormonism. <laughs> yes well said <laughs> i've been able to glimpse some of your work and um and i noticed that there's a section on how people respond to authority mm -hmm. and different types of authority in different generations and i think we've um that actually may be related to this question of doubt can you just talk mm -hmm. about that i think it's very related because when you grow up in a tradition that is telling you authority comes from this one place, this one prophetic source, mm. and then for whatever reason, whatever issue that brings you to question that, you're not just questioning the piece of information you were taught, you're also questioning the source right. that taught it. And so when Mormonism makes such a close relationship between those things, which it has since you know about 1950, boom, 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 then you also have to expect that when people begin questioning the information, they will also begin questioning the source. Mm. So that's something to think about as we move forward in the future. The authority chapter of the book is, was a really interesting one to write for me because I thought that it was going to be just a matter of going through the data about different kinds of authority, the local authority, the relational authority versus what we call um, institutional authority, mm -hmm. because millennials as a whole, as a generation in America, have a, a fairly distant relationship with institutional authority. And I was curious about how that would manifest in the church. But, uh, but what surprised me the most <coughs> was the way that in the oral history interviews, people wanted to talk about patriarchal blessings, mm. which we didn't ask any questions about in the survey. Mm -hmm. So I wound up slightly changing the interview template so I could add two questions about patriarchal blessings mm. just to those oral history respondents. 
And it was so fascinating. So I wound up changing the chapter, adding a section on patriarchal blessings, and then kind of telling the story. Like, the chapter was supposed to end there, but then there's this. Because patriarchal blessings in inhabit this hybrid space. They are deeply personal. They are relational. They are, you know, considered in Mormonism a bit of a, a roadmap, individualized roadmap for your own life. But they come through the auspices of the institutional church. They are given by a stake patriarch who is ordained just for that purpose. If you want to get a copy of it, you have to do so through the institutional church. And the auspices of the institutional church work together with that sense of individual authority. Mm. And the fact that the church encourages people to not talk about their patriarchal blessings mm. actually seems to increase the feeling of individual authority that people exercise because they are the ones who are the theologians who are interpreting mm. and reinterpreting their right. own patriarchal blessings given the changing circumstances of their lives. So that was a very interesting thing. And the, the affection that most millennials seem to have for their patriarchal blessings to me was a hint that we need more of that. Right. Of so it's not that they can't them. deal with authority. Right. It's not that they don't want direction. Yeah. Um, it's about the way in which that comes vertically. Mm -hmm. There's different ways of receiving vertical direction. Well said. Mm -hmm. I think with patriarchal blessings, the vertical slash hierarchical aspect of it is more muted than it may be in other aspects of Mormonism. And because it's so personal. It is. And they're physically laying their hands personal. on their heads. Yes. And they probably know that. I mean, the person who gave me my patriarchal blessing had known me since I was a baby. Oh, really? You know? Wow. Yeah. Wow. So, um, I, you know, I think a common question that people have, you know, when we talk about, like you talk about how millennials have, are more distant from institutional authority. Mm -hmm. One kind of knee-jerk reaction might be, well, they're just slackers. They're lazy, disobedient, and they, you know, won't do what they're told even when people tell them to do the right thing. So um, what would your response be to that? Well, I would say they're wrong. Um, <laughs> You know, for example, statistically, this generation is more likely to finish college mm. than previous generations have. That doesn't seem like the slacker definition mm. to me. But then again, I'm operating under a circumstance in which education is considered to be a value that we hold dear. So it depends on how you define slacker, depends on what values you are wishing to impart to the next generation. Am I, yeah. Well, I mean, I guess... And I guess this applies to doubt more generally. Mm -hmm. So I've also been reading this um, religious literature right now on retention mm -hmm. and, um, and, and why people you know, decide to leave any religion. And, um, and there's just, you know, this tension between, um, you know, accommodation with society um, and um, distinctiveness that we have to walk. And Armin Moss has talked about this in right. The Angel and the Beehive. And it's brilliant. So, um, where do millennials then? I mean, because one temptation might be to say um, millennials don't like, you know, vertical authority because they don't like people telling them what to do. They just want to, you know, fit in in normal society. What do you see as, um, as maybe different, however, sources of tension? You know, because I agree with you. The people I know, for instance, who don't feel safe at church are not slackers. They're not people who are trying to be more permissive. If anything, they're extremely value-oriented. Yes. And um, they're extremely loving. And that's why um, they feel, um, tragically, that they can't be in the church communities where they are because um, mm -hmm. they're not that those values for them, um, from their point of view, are not, are not appreciated there or are not taught at church. Um, and, you know, in some of the interviews, it was very interesting where former Mormons were talking about uh, really having a deep moral center that prevented them from continued affiliation with the church. Because if you hold inclusivity and equality and justice as your primary values, it becomes very difficult to look at, for example, a church policy toward the, the children of same-sex couples being barred from baptism and say, that's of God. Mm. That becomes a very, very difficult leap for them to make. And so it's not a question of, of immorality, but maybe perhaps a hyper-morality, that there's a sense in which 
their institutional affiliation has to match completely with, with what is in their hearts. And actually that's something that they learned at church. Right. And in some ways it's kind of a self-inflicted blow, isn't mm. it? Um, because we all know that none of us are perfect. We all have, you know, held callings and we know that in those, as soon as, you know, we are called to that calling, we have deeply, um, we have made that calling deeply flawed because that's just who we are. So, um, I wonder if, if one, another way, in addition to, um, being more loving, being aware of who's in the room, I wonder if it would be helpful to, um, To, um, what's the right word? Um, to soften our language of our own perfection. Um, mm -hmm. I think sometimes we set standards for the church, for the church's leaders, and for kind of ourselves as a people that are, that are impossible to reach. Mm -hmm. um, the, the rhetoric of, you know, we're the best, the awesomest, um, the most righteous, the most Christ-like. That's just really hard to maintain. Um, and then when we mm -hmm. fall short of that standard, um, people who really wanted that rhetoric um, to be completely true, are, are, are disenchanted. Mm. Yeah. Um, on the other hand, that doesn't sound to me like a great recipe for, you know, attracting people. You've hit upon the grand <laughs> sociological dilemma. Right? We're not that awesome. We're very problematic. We're very flawed. <laughs> Come and join, join us. Join our church. <laughs> no, that's exactly right. And I think it, one, of the, one of the interesting things about, about the theory of why people are attracted to religion and why they stay with mm. religion is that they have to feel that there's something unique, that there's right. something special that they are receiving there that they would not get somewhere right. else. Which you and I clearly feel, or else we would not be here. Right. Like, we're... Right. I'm a convert. I, I had other options. I was studying to be a pastor, right, in a Protestant right. church. So I could have done something else. But... I chose to be here and I continue to make that choice mm. every week that I choose to be here. Um, but sociologically, how do you find that balance between preserving uniqueness? This is what Armin Moss talks about right. in the angel and the beehive as kind of the retrenchment, mm. but not being so unique that you alienate. And then how do you, and that's the assimilation part. How do you reconcile that in a rapidly changing culture? Right. That's, I and think, where multiple Mormonism cultures. is We've having. Yes. 200 different that's cultures right, right. where we're embedded. It's, it's changing and it's also diversifying, um, but it's changing faster than the church has an institutional ability to assimilate. Right. Yeah. And, and I think it's really important there that you say the church's institutional ability to assimilate is important. What's also important is just people. We are also the church. Mm -hmm. um, we are also the institution. And um, mm. I think awareness of that um, is, is key. It's not just what comes out in the mass media. You know? Well, and it's that's something what I think we say in, on is, Sunday school. Exactly. And I think that that is something that does speak to Gen Xers and millennials. In, in Greek, we have this ekklesia. Mm. So this is where we get the word church. But it didn't mean building. It didn't mm. mean institution. Right. It meant the people who are called. Mm -hmm. right? The called out mm -hmm. people, the gathered people. And that's the part of church that we could stand to emphasize more if we want to speak to millennials on their level. So building those relationships, knowing who right. they are, knowing that we're speaking to them mm -hmm. and, and just loving and respecting them. And we need to stop thinking of millennials as a project. <laughs> oh, Mormonism, we love projects, <laughs> turn people into projects. Let's not turn an entire generation into a project. Mm. Because the more that you kind of uh, worry this question, then that in itself becomes alienating. Right. When, when people perceive that they are seen as a problem to be solved. 